Welcome fifth graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. We'd like to give a special welcome to a number of schools who are with us this afternoon. We have Arthur Kramer, F.P. Kaye, Marcela Steen, Stevens Park, David G. Burnett, Urban Park, Nancy Cochran, H.S. Thompson Steen, Mata Montessori, and C.M. Soto Elementary with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we wish you could be here in person, but since you can't be, we're going to do our best to make you feel like you're here during a virtual field trip experience today. If you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash three dash five registration to get yourself or your class registered for this virtual field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. And today's virtual field trip is going to be all about the sun, earth and moon system. During this virtual field trip, students will compare the physical characteristics of the sun, earth and moon and explore the day night cycle, seasons and the lunar cycle. So we're going to start things off today by exploring the day night cycle with Mr. Dominguez. Next, we're going to explore all four seasons with Mr. Mirez. Next, we will explore the lunar cycle with Ms. Shram. And last but not least, we're going to look at the physical characteristics of the sun, earth and moon with Mr. Monroe. While we're doing that, um, you can ask us questions and we, we, we encourage you to ask questions. Since this is a virtual field trip, the way you ask a question is you'll need to go to www.tiny.cc slash question dash answer to fill out a super short form for us to submit any questions you have re related to the sun, earth, moon system. You can ask as many questions as you like and we'll do our best to answer the, all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let me stop sharing my screen here and turn things over to Mr. Dominguez is going to get us started with the day night cycle. Hey guys, it's a very beautiful day here at the EEC and today we are going to talk about the day and night cycle. So we are going to answer some pretty simple questions in this portion of your virtual field trip. How does night happen and how does day happen? And we are also going to check out some pretty cool animals that are active throughout different portions of this cycle. So as you can tell, we have some goats here and they are very active during the day. So that means that they are diurnal. So here comes Benji and some of his pig friends. But we're also going to check out some other animals that are active during the night. Those animals are nocturnal. So let's get started and let's figure out how day and night happen. All right, guys, so we have this pretty awesome model of our solar system that you can find uh, on NASA's website. And the way day and night work is pretty simple. So the Earth rotates around its axis. So the Earth is always rotating. And as you can see, a part of the Earth is dark. And why is that? Well, look at the part of Earth that's facing the sun. It's not this part, it's this part over here. So in this portion of Earth, it is currently daytime. And on the side that is not facing the sun, it is nighttime. So as the Earth rotates around its axis, this side that is currently dark will eventually rotate towards the sun and it'll be daytime when that happens. So the Earth takes 24 hours to do a full rotation around its axis. So that is how we get daytime and nighttime. Pretty simple, right? It is the rotation of Earth around its axis. And it takes about 12 hours for this portion of Earth to rotate towards the sun and another 12 hours for this portion to rotate towards the part that is not facing the sun. Most of the animals that we have at our center are active during the day. So our cows, our goats, we have bearded dragons and tortoises. All of these animals sleep during the nighttime and are active during the daytime. So they are diurnal. So we are diurnal animals too. 
but I have some pretty awesome geckos at home that are active during the nighttime. They sleep during the day and come out to hunt during the nighttime. So they are considered nocturnal. Here we have Chewy. He is my Chihua gecko. Chihua geckos are native to the island of New Caledonia and they are excellent climbers, but he's not showing you a very good example of what he truly can do. He's got some uh, pads and claws that are perfect for climbing. So these guys in the wild live very high up uh, in the trees and they usually hunt for insects. They are uh, primarily insectivores, but will eat some fruit from time to time. So here we have Chewy slipping on his uh, food dish. He's being silly. Well, not all animals are active during the day. Some are active during the night. They are nocturnal. Did you guys know that there's actually some animals that are neither nocturnal or diurnal and are actually most active during the twilight hours of the day? So they are most active when there is very little sunlight. So think of dawn and dusk. Uh, I, have an, uh, I have a leopard gecko right here and leopard geckos are considered crepuscular. So that is the term to use when an animal is neither nocturnal or diurnal, but instead uh, are most active during the twilight hours of the day. So I usually feed them I usually feed my leopard geckos before I go to work because I wake up at around 6, 45, uh, and that's usually when the sun is just rising. I also have a few of their cousins, the African fat tail geckos, and that's another species that is also crepuscular, so most active during the twilight hours of the day. So here we have Luna, my leopard gecko, enjoying some roaches. And finally, we have diurnal animals. We have these cows. You and I are diurnal animals, and we use every bit of the 12 hours of daylight that we get to work, to go to school, to play, to learn. And I know that these cows are enjoying some daylight along with the heat that that wonderful star we call the sun provides. So they are relaxing, eating some grass, and when nighttime comes, they'll rest. I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual field trip. I will see you guys next time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. Um, got a few questions that I'm gonna answer uh, right now. Uh, the first is from Carlos. What is the difference between climate and weather? Uh, climate is the average weather over a long period of time, like decades or even centuries in a place. So Texas has a um, kind of a warmer climate than say Minnesota, which is farther up north. Weather can change even in minutes, uh, whereas climate takes a long, long time to change if it changes at all. And then we have a question from Moises. How does the earth rotate? Uh, no one knows for sure. Um, it has been rotating since the solar system formed, and no one knows for sure how the planets got put into their uh, motion that they're in right now, but um, it does rotate um, every day, once every 24 hours. And then one last question is from Kevin, uh, who I've got to give a shout out to because he said, please, and his question is, what would happen if the Earth moved from its place in space? Uh, if, the, if the Earth moved farther away from the sun, um, we would have a longer orbit around the sun. So a longer year is my guess. And um, it would also be colder. And if we moved closer, we would have a shorter year. It would be warmer. So we're lucky that we're just the distance that we are from the sun so that we have the, the length of year that we have and it's not too cold or not too warm. All right, now we're going to explore uh, seasonal cycles with Mr. Ramirez. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about the reason for the seasons. Uh, so before we get started, I do have an animal friend to show you because the seasons actually impact our animal and plant friends, too. Uh, so my animal friend, you've probably met him before. His name is Spike, and he's a bearded dragon. 
And he's affected by the seasons because he is a cold blooded reptile. So because he's cold blooded, uh, they cannot regulate their body temperature really well. So he's very dependent on the outside temperature. So when it's super cold outside, a lot of our reptile friends will roommate. Roommate is a type of hibernation that reptiles will go through. You also might notice that during the cold winter time, some of our birds will actually migrate or move to where it's warmer. Some of our mammal friends might even hibernate or sleep. So the changing temperatures and the changing length of day will actually impact our plants and animals. So I'm gonna go ahead and put our little animal friend up and we'll start our presentation. Let me get our screen share started. And I do have a couple of questions for you guys to keep in mind. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, y'all will be able to answer these two questions. The first is what causes the seasons? And the second is what is the summer solstice? Uh, so be keeping an eye out for those answers as we go through the presentation. So I'm gonna show you guys a little video where I am modeling the reason for the season. So let me play that video. What are some things that you notice or see on our globe? So the first thing we see is that we notice that planet Earth is tilted. And we notice that it is tilted at about a 23 and a half degree tilt along what's called an axis. An axis is just an imaginary line that goes through the center of our planet. And that is the line through which Earth rotates or spins around. And you guys learned in the earlier segment that rotating is what causes day and night. You'll also notice on our globe, we have another line and it's this big long blue line that you guys see here. That line is called the equator. It's another imaginary line uh, that separates the Northern hemisphere from the Southern hemisphere. And you all know that we live on the Northern hemisphere. We live right over here on in North America and we live in the United States. In this model, we're gonna be exploring how Earth's tilt creates the season. So let's take a look at our first position. So here we have planet Earth and here is the sun. When the Earth is in this position around its orbit, what season do you think the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing? I'll give you guys just a quick second to think about it. And hopefully you guys said that the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing its summertime. And we know that because if we look at the tilt, the tilt is facing toward the sun. So that means those people living on the Northern Hemisphere are receiving more direct rays from the sun. So they're experiencing their summertime. Now on the opposite end, those living in the Southern Hemisphere are experiencing their winter time because they are receiving more indirect rays from the sun. Now we also have what's called the summer solstice. Think of it as like the beginning of summertime and it's usually around June 20th to June 21st. And during the summer solstice, the Earth's tilt toward the sun is at its maximum. So during this time, we will have our longest day of the year. Now our Earth is gonna continue to revolve or orbit around the sun. Again, that just means it's going to move around. So we're gonna make it revolve and now we're in this position. But what do you guys notice about the location of our planet now? So hopefully you guys noticed that the axis is now no longer pointing either toward or away from the sun. So because of this position, the northern hemisphere is now experiencing their fall time. And something interesting is the fall equinox marks the first day of fall, and that's usually around September 23rd. Now, if we break down that word equinox, it sort of sounds like equal. Equinox just means on that day that the uh, length of daytime and nighttime is almost about the same. So now Earth is going to continue moving around. It's going to continue revolving or orbiting. And now we're in this position. So what season do you think is represented here for North America? And hopefully you guys notice that tilt. Uh, it is now tilted away from the sun. So that means here in North America where we live, we are actually experiencing our winter time because North America is receiving indirect rays from the sun. On the other hand, look over here, we can see that the Southern hemisphere is now experiencing the most direct rays. So they are actually experiencing their summertime. 
And something interesting about this, the very first day of winter, we call it the winter solstice. The winter solstice is usually around December 21st to December 22nd, and it marks the day where the Earth's tilt is furthest away from the sun. And that's usually going to be our shortest day of the year. Our Earth is going to continue its revolution around the sun. And now we're here at this point. So what season do you think is represented by this? And hopefully I said the season of spring. So again, notice the tilt. This time the tilt is not faced toward the sun. It's not faced away from the sun. And so because of its position, we now have another equinox. Uh, so the spring equinox, also called the vernal equinox, is, is around March 21st. During the equinox, we experience roughly equal daylight hours and nighttime hours. Now we're going to continue revolving around and we're back to our first position. Again, we're back to the summertime for the Northern Hemisphere. And hopefully you guys notice that the direction of the tilt never changed. So it was always tilted this way, no matter which way it went as it revolved. And again, we know that the tilt is responsible for the season. It's also important to note that as the Earth is revolving around the sun, it's also rotating. So just keep in mind the Earth is revolving and rotating at the same time. This is a quick little poem to help you guys remember what revolution means. So your left hand is gonna represent the sun. You can go ahead and ball it in a fist. Your right hand is gonna represent the Earth. You can also make it into a fist. And we're gonna start our little rhyme. Revolution, revolve, how does the earth revolve? Revolution, revolve, how does the earth revolve? Earth makes an orbit, orbit around the sun. Earth makes an orbit, orbit around the sun. Now we're gonna pretend we are the earth. So go ahead and take your index finger, put it on your head and tilt, just like our tilted earth. Remember it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees. And we're gonna sing our next part. The tilt brings the seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. The tilt brings the seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. So we're gonna go ahead and move over to our next little review so slide. And teachers feel free to pause the video to see if your students can identify the seasons for the Northern hemisphere represented in these four illustrations. Um, and again, while you guys are trying to figure out the answers to that, I just wanna remind you guys that the seasons are caused by Earth's tilt. So I wanna just um, address a common misconception. So a common misconception is that the seasons are uh, caused due to Earth being closer or further from the sun. We know that that is not true. So we know that seasons are caused by Earth's tilt. Now to address the misconception about the distances, um, it is true that Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle, uh, but compared to how far away the sun is, that very small change in Earth's distance throughout the year, it doesn't make a much of a difference in our seasons or the weather. So the distance from Earth, uh, the distance between Earth and the sun is not what causes the seasons. We know that it is the tilt that is responsible for the seasons. And something that you guys can do on your own time is to visit this online interactive uh, the website is here, but I'm going to go ahead and show you what that interactive looks like. So let me get out of our slides and bring up um, the internet page. Uh, so this is from Step Up Seasons Interactive, and it's a fun little interactive that you guys can play around with. So here I have the uh, equator and the tropics highlighted for you guys. You can play around to see what would happen if the earth was not tilted versus the actual tilt that we have. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it at the 25, uh, 23 and a half degree tilt. You can also play around uh, with different locations and also with the month. So let's put it to the current month, which is January. We'll go ahead and bring it. So here's the position now. And of course, you know that for the Northern hemisphere, we are currently experiencing our winter because the Northern hemisphere is tilted uh, away from the sun. So they're receiving the indirect sunlight. Now we know on the other hand, those on the Southern hemisphere are experiencing their summer. So this is a fun little interactive that you guys can play around with to kind of model and see how the earth's tilt 
affects our season. So I'm going to go ahead and stop our screen share and I'm going to give it back to uh, Mr. or sorry, uh, yes, Mr. Broughton this time uh, to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Uh, let's see. Isaiah asked, why does the sun not hit the earth? And that is because the earth is about 150 million kilometers from the sun. So um, it's, it's very far away from the sun. And even though the sun's gravity is pulling on the earth, the earth has inertia um, that keeps it from just being um, pulled straight into the sun. Uh, Nevea asked, uh, why does the sky look blue? And that is because um, the air molecules in the sky reflect blue light. And so that's what makes the sky look blue. Um, Jolie, Joy Lee asks, is there another planet that can sustain life? Maybe uh, scientists have discovered over 4,000 exoplanets and some of them uh, may sustain life, but we have not discovered any life off the earth um, yet. And let's see, what causes blood moons? Uh, a blood moon is when the moon looks red because it is in a uh, lunar eclipse. So sometimes we have a lunar eclipse and that makes the moon look red. All right, now we're going to explore the moon some more um, I, through the lunar cycle with Mishram. Hey everybody, it's Mishram. Good afternoon. And we are talking all about the moon. So I'm glad that person asked about the blood moon because I will be talking about that in a little bit. So let me get my screen going. Okay, here we go. Our moon. Okay, so the moon is our only natural satellite. Of course, we've put many satellites around the earth, but it is our only natural occurring satellite. Um, we believe that it was caused by a Mars sized asteroid hitting the earth and having a chunk of rock break off, which is now our moon. Um, it is about a fourth the size of Earth. So if you were using kind of common objects and you had a basketball to represent the Earth, the moon would be about the size of a tennis ball, which I do not have with me, but you can um, imagine those. So the Earth would be the basketball and the moon would be the tennis ball. Um, the Earth's moon is the fifth largest uh, moon in our solar system. So our solar system has over 200 moons orbiting different planets. We only have one and ours is the fifth largest. Uh, so there's tons and tons and tons more. 24 people have been to the moon and 12 people have walked on the moon. So I have some pictures of the Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969 with Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. All right, so if you go out every night and look at the moon, you will notice it looks different every single night. From day to day, it looks a little bit different um, every time you go out. And different times in the month, it will look bigger or smaller. You'll be able to see more of the face, less of the face. Um, these are our phases of the moon, and it's caused by the lunar cycle. So this little diagram I got from uh, Nat Geo Kids, and this is my favorite one so far because it's labeled and it kind of makes it a little more clear. So you can see the sun and the earth, and then of course we have the moon as it goes around the earth. So we are orbiting the sun and the moon is orbiting us. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of movement going on. So it gets kind of confusing. That's why I like this one. So this is kind of showing you the moon's orbit. Um, so when the moon is in this position, we have the dark side of the moon facing us. So here on earth, when we look at the moon, we are not able to see the part that is illuminated by the sun. So we can only see the dark part and it will go around us and keep moving and keep moving and keep moving until it reaches the other side. And then you can see the illuminated half of the moon is facing us so we can see the full moon. As it goes on, it gets darker and darker again until we get back to the new moon. So I like this 
diagram just to show you the movement of the moon in relation to the earth. But what we would see from our perspective is this. So that new moon I showed you, when it was kind of between the sun and the earth, we see just a dark circle. Then you can slowly see more and more of the moon illuminated, more and more until halfway through the month, you see the full moon where you see the entire face of the moon. And then once again, it gets darker and darker, darker and darker until we have another new moon. So once again, this is like looking at it, if you were out from outer space, looking at the whole setup, and then here is what we can see from Earth. So each lunar cycle takes one month. Um, at the beginning of the month is a new moon. Halfway through the month is full moon. And then we go all the way back to a new moon. So as the light is growing, it's called waxing. So we have this shape, which is the crescent moon. So this is called a waxing crescent because it is getting lighter. Then we have the first quarter moon. Now you might think, why isn't this first half? Well, if you think about it, this is only showing a quarter of the moon because we know the moon is three dimensional, right? So this is the first quarter moon. Then we have a waxing gibbous. So the gibbous is the um, kind of opposite of the crescent, right? It's mostly full as opposed to mostly dark. Then we have the full moon. And then instead of waxing where it's getting lighter, we have waning where it's getting darker. So we have the waning gibbous, the last quarter moon, and the waning crescent moon. So those are the phases of the moon. And here they are. So if you were to go out every single day um, or every single night and kind of document what the moon looks like each night, this is what you would come up with. So this is for January 22. So we are here on the 18th. Yesterday was actually the full moon. Um, so you can see that's when the whole face is illuminated and it's the brightest. So if you go out tonight, with grown-ups permission to look at the moon, you'll be seeing almost a full moon. So it's not quite as lovely as last night, but it still looks really good. So you'll see it almost full moon. And then we know that it is going to be waning until, whoops, until we get to the 31st and February 1st, we'll have another new moon and we'll start the cycle again. All right. So lunar cycle takes one month. Now, last night was called a wolf moon. So different times of year um, or different times of the month, you can see different portions of the moon and there's all sorts of special lunar events. So we've got lots of different names and categories that they put the moon under depending on what we can see. So the wolf moon is every year, the January full moon is known as wolf moon. Um, I think it originally got this name because you can often hear the wolves howling at night um, this time of year. Uh, their misconception was that wolves only howl because they're starving in the winter, but really wolves howl to communicate with each other, um, to hunt their prey, or say one of the wolves wander off to communicate for them to come back. But you can often hear wolves howling in the winter time. Um, and this is known now as the wolf moon. So the wolf moon just means the January full moon. And so that happens every year. And so here's a picture of our wolf moon last night on January 17th. And then we also have what um, someone already asked about, the blood moon. So a blood moon is caused by a total lunar eclipse. And it's called a blood moon because of its coloring. So obviously you could see it looks like it's illuminated in red and it's caused by the earth's shadow. So we can get pretty complicated with it, but I'm gonna to try to keep it simple. So we know of course the moon is orbiting the earth and the earth is orbiting the sun. So we have this sun here and something special happens when the sun, the earth, and then the moon are perfectly aligned. So you can see the earth has a shadow because we are bigger than the moon and it is close enough for us to completely block out the sun's light. 
So there's two parts of the earth shadow, the penumbra, which is a partial shadow and the umbra, which is a full shadow. And so there's different classifications if the moon isn't perfectly aligned, um, if it's in the penumbra or if it's in the umbra. Um, so I'm just focusing on the total lunar eclipse. So that's when it's um, completely aligned in the umbra. So what basically happens is different um, frequencies of light, different rays are blocked and certain colors bend. So the red light is able to light up the moon and illuminate the moon, causing it to look red. Now it gets way more complicated, but the moral of the story is the red light is able to access the moon. And so that is what color it appears. And it only happens when those three are lined up. Boom. All right, then there is a super moon. So the super moon is when the moon appears much, much larger, which really it's because it is closer. So here's a picture of a super moon um, in Dallas here, where's our skyline um, in 2018, so a few years ago. Um, what causes a super moon? So I told you it is when we are closest to the moon. So like you learned earlier, the Earth's orbit around the sun is not perfect. Um, it's not a perfect circle. And the moon's orbit around the Earth is not a perfect circle. So it is on an ellipsis. It's on an ellipses. It's not perfectly round. It's oval shaped, right? So that means that at some point, the moon is going to be closer to the Earth. And some points it's going to be further from the earth. So the point when it is closest is called perigee and what is furthest is apogee. So when the moon is full and on perigee, that causes a super moon. So we have a full moon when it's at perigee. So those two things have to happen in order to create a super moon. So that's why we don't have one every month. So it has to have those two factors. Now, what happens when the moon is at perigee and it's a full moon and it's an eclipse? Then you have a super blood moon like we had last year. And this is a picture that NASA tweeted out. So this was a super blood moon in 2021. So remember that has to be when the moon is at apogee, when it is full and when it's totally lined up with the earth and the sun. So it causes a total lunar eclipse. So that is called a super blood moon. And if you look it up, there's all sorts of different names for moons, depending on what um, month it is in the year, how much of it you can see, what color it looks like. There's tons and tons and tons of um, different types of moons. So here is my kind of example of that. So this calendar is from dateandtime.com uh, from the Old Farmer's Almanac. So this is when you can see the full moons in 2022. And you can see every month they have a different nickname. So the one last night, like we learned is called the wolf moon. Uh, February 16th, we have the snow moon. And then going on every month that has um, the predicted time and date of the full moons. So this is listed at Eastern time. So that's gonna be an hour ahead. So you just, add one hour and that's when we'll have it. Um, and the super moons, which we learned about just now are happening on June 14th and July 13th. So remember those are the months that it's closest to us. And then the lunar eclipse when the sun, earth and moon will line up, that will happen in May and November. So that's when you can plan on seeing those moons. I highly recommend it. It's super fun. Um, the pictures are awesome, but it's way more amazing to see for yourself. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you have a great rest of your field trip, and I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you, Ms. Shram. I'm going to answer a few more questions here that have come in. Uh, Elijah asked, how long does it take for Pluto to orbit the sun? It takes Pluto... 248 years to orbit the sun one time. So in your whole life, Pluto will not orbit the sun even once. Uh, let's see. How long does it take for the Earth to rotate? Uh, Liana asked that. It takes the Earth one day or 24 hours to rotate on its axis. 
Uh, Carlos asked, does the weather or does the climate and weather change year to year? Weather can change year to year, but climate takes longer than that. Climate takes decades or even centuries um, to change. Um, let's see. What causes the seasons? Martin from Stevens Park asked that. The earth revolving around the sun and being tilted is what causes the seasons. And then uh, to go along with that question, why is it, why in the summer is it really hot? And in January, it is very cold. Jose asked that. In the summertime, um, Texas is tilted almost toward, directly towards the sun, so it is very hot. But in January, in the winter, we have revolved halfway around the sun, so we're on the other side of the sun and tilted away from the sun, and that's what makes it colder. Aubrey asked, what would happen if the Earth stopped rotating? We would have no more day and night cycle like we have now. Uh, Gerardo asked, does the sun rotate? Yes, it does. I'll let you look up how fast it rotates. Um, at different parts of the sun rotate at different speeds, believe it or not, since it's a gas. And uh, that's about all I, I'm going to do right now. Um, we're going to get to our final teacher here, Mr. Monroe, who's going to explain the characteristics of the sun, earth, and moon to us. Okay, good afternoon, students. We're going to be looking at the different characteristics of the sun, the earth, and the moon. Here I have a model of the sun, the earth, and the moon. And you know, they have a very special relationship. You've already learned a lot about their relationship, being that the earth revolves around the sun and the moon revolves around the earth. Now, we're going to be learning about the different characteristics of each of these terrestrial bodies. We're going to start out with the sun. Now, you know what? We look at that sun and we realize that the sun is very hot, right? That sun, that huge star that's over 4.6 billion years old, you know, it's really hot, so hot that it glows. And you know, one would think that maybe it's the same type of heat that is created by fire, but it's not. In fact, you know, to have a fire, you would have to maybe be uh, using some type of fuel like we use here on earth, such as wood or some type of fossil fuel, but that's not what's happening with the sun. In fact, what's going on with the sun, because most of the gases that are found in the sun, the majority of the gas is found is hydrogen. Now, hydrogen has a reaction with helium, and that's going on in the core of the sun. Now, the sun is a spherical body, right? Now, when we talk about the atmosphere of one of these bodies, we are actually talking about the gases that surround that body. Now, the sun does have an atmosphere, and that atmosphere is really, really thick. In fact, if we look at the makeup of the sun and the gas hydrogen that is found in the sun, that hydrogen, those gases are so tightly packed together, it's incredibly dense. And that creates a strong ga a gravity force. Now, the temperature of the sun we're going to start out with the coolest part of the sun, and that would be the surface. The surface is the coolest part of the sun, and that temperature could be as hot as 5,500 degrees Celsius or 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the hottest part of the sun is where all that reaction, that building up of energy, which is causing the sun to glow like it does, that temperature there could range anywhere from 15 million degrees centigrade to 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. You know, other features of the sun that have been observed are sunspots and solar flare. These are things that are happening on the surface of the sun. You know, the sunspots are the dark spots that sometimes astronomers would pick up with these high power telescopes. And those sunspots have a tendency to move around or appear every 11 years. Now, the solar flares, they occur on the surface of the planet. 
And that's a buildup of tremendous energy that almost gives so much energy off, it's like a small explosion, not a small one, but a large explosion on the surface. You know, the sun has more mass than any other object in our solar system. You know, as far as size, one million Earths could fit inside the sun. Boy, that's amazing. Now let's talk about the home planet, the planet Earth. The planet Earth is considered to be, it's a sphere also. The planet Earth is considered to be a solid. Even below our oceans, the Earth is solid. Sometimes referred to as the rocky planet. But you know what? It is not all completely solid. Deep inside the center of our planet, the part that we call the core, there is a liquid that makes up the core. It's a mixture of metals, mostly iron and nickel. Now we do have an atmosphere. It's not as thick as the sun's atmosphere, but we do have an atmosphere. And oxygen and nitrogen are the gases that make up the atmosphere of our planet. You know, meteorologists that study the atmosphere, they like to refer to our atmosphere as the air bubble that surrounds our planet. And believe it or not, that atmosphere is very important to us. It's like a protective blanket, okay? Now, some of the physical features of our planet, and we can see it in a lot of our, our global maps, our globe map, we have mountains, we have volcanoes, we have forests, we have liquid water that covers 70% of the surface of our planet. And even our atmosphere contains forms of water in the three natural states of matter. We can find water vapor, which is the gas form. We can also find the liquid form in uh, the makeup of clouds. We know that clouds are made up of water droplets. And then we can also find the solid form, which is usually ice crystals, okay? Now, Listen, guys, while I'm going through this, I want you to be thinking about some of the ways that these bodies, because they are companions, they are companions because they have a relationship with each other, how they are alike. There are several ways that they are alike with their characteristics. Now, the smallest object of the three is the moon. Now, that moon, it has a rough surface. It's a solid surface and it's rocky. The thing is, there are no volcanoes, no active volcanoes. If we look at a moon, and I don't have one to show you right now, but if we looked at the moon and you've seen images of the moon with Miss Ramirez and, and Miss uh, Shram, there are a lot of lighter colored areas and there are some darker colored areas. The lighter color areas have been known to be what they call heels. And you know what? Some of these features, you might say, well, how do we know? Some of these features, gosh, me, they were discovered by astronauts that set foot on the moon in the year of 1969. So that's how we know. So the lighter areas would be heels or the highlands. The darker areas would be considered the plains at one time before astronauts set foot on the moon, it was thought that maybe these were seas, maybe they were uh, bodies of water, but there is no water on the surface of the moon. The moon has no atmosphere, which, oh boy, that really contributes to extreme temperatures. When we look at the temperatures during daylight hours or daytime, the temperature can get as high as 123 degrees Celsius or 253 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, it drops tremendously. It drops down to a minus 233 degrees Celsius or a minus 387 degrees Fahrenheit. Because there's no active volcanoes, and I'll say that again, no active volcanoes, but I'll tell you this, there is magma found underneath the surface of the moon. You see, we have magma underneath our crust, very similar. So no active volcanoes, 
no flowing rivers, no rainfall or wind, the moon really rarely changes its surface. In fact, footprints from some of the first astronauts to walk on the moon in 1969 are still visible in the moon dust. And as far as a size comparison, you could take 50 moons and put them inside the Earth. Now, as far as a temperature comparison, you know, the average temperature on Earth for our home planet is 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty good as compared to the other bodies that we learned a little bit about their characteristics. So right now, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Broughton. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And there were quite a few more questions, um, but unfortunately we are out of time. So I'm going to have to email the answers to your teachers. So you will get the answers um, today or tomorrow. But I'm gonna share my screen um, one last time here this afternoon so we can do a quick recap of what we did today. Um, today's virtual field trip was all about the sun, earth and moon system. During this virtual field trip, students compared the physical characteristics of the sun, earth and moon and explored the day-night cycle seasons and the lunar cycle. So we started things off by exploring the day-night cycle with Mr. Dominguez. Next, we explored seasons with Mr. Mirez. Third, we explored the lunar cycle with Ms. Shram. And we just explored the physical characteristics of the sun, earth, and moon with Mr. Monroe. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about the sun, earth, and moon system with us. And for all the great questions that you asked, there were some that I didn't get to, but um, I'll get I'll get to them through an email. Uh, you can let us know if you enjoyed this virtual field trip or not by going to www.tiny.cc/3-5feedback and filling out a short feedback form for us. We hope to see you again during our next virtual field trip for fifth graders. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>